Just now we chanted the sort of setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. Sometimes people ask, where's the wheel? It's in the part where the Buddha goes through the Four Noble Truths and points out that there are three levels of knowledge for each. One is knowing the truth. The second is knowing the duty with regard to the truth. And then the third is knowing that the duty has been completed. Four truths, three levels of knowledge, gives twelve permutations altogether. In English we would call that a table, where you set out all the different permutations. In the time of the Buddha they called it a wheel. They used that in philosophical treatises and in legal treatises. Like in the Vinaya, there are lots of wheels that go through the permutations of a particular rule. And then if you do it with a particular perception, what's the result in terms of the penalty? And when you do it with a different perception, what's the result? And it goes through all the different permutations. Those are wheels. The important point being, of course, that we don't just have four truths that are interesting facts about suffering, but they're truths that carry duties. And awakening means completing the duties for all of them. This is what appropriate attention is all about, looking at your experience in terms of those truths and the duties that have to be done. When they're suffering, you look to see, well, what is the suffering here? And the Buddha says something radical. He starts out, of course, with pretty common examples of suffering, There's aging, illness, and death, birth, aging, and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair having to be with what you don't like, having to be separated from what you do like, not getting what you want. That's all pretty ordinary. The radical part is when he says it's the five clinging aggregates. We read elsewhere that the aggregates themselves are not the problem. Arahants have aggregates, but they don't suffer. It's the clinging. And the idea that the clinging is the suffering, that takes a lot of getting used to. And it's also challenging us. Things that we cling to are things that we like, most, for the most part, or else things that we feel we have to hold on to. If we don't hold on to them, we'll feel, we'll feel lost. Sometimes we can cling to pretty negative things out of a sense that we'd have to do it. But whether you like the things you're clinging to or not, still there's a reason for wanting to hold on. And the Buddha is saying that clinging itself is the, is the suffering. So you have to look into that. What is the clinging? There's sensuality clinging, view clinging, habit and practice clinging, doctrine of self clinging. Sensuality has to do with your likes, what you want, usually it's sensual pleasures. And you can think about what you want. In fact, that's the sensuality. Is the Fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. The views are your views about what the world is like. And those two are connected. If you want sensual pleasure, this is the world in which you're in. This is where the world where sensual pleasures can be found. And should you? That's habit and practice clinging. How do you go about that? And then, of course, there's you who's negotiating all this, the you who hopes to gain the pleasure, and the you who feels that either you're competent or not competent to do it. These are the things that cause the suffering. These are the things that are the suffering. And once you realize that that's the suffering, then you look for, well, why do you cling? That's why the Buddha has you look at craving, because otherwise we tend to place the blame on things outside. The climate is horrible. Society is horrible. Politics are horrible. There's a great Doonesbury cartoon where a soldier is just coming back from the Iraqi war, and he's been brain damaged. He gets back, and his parents tell him what's been going on in the country. And he tries to get one word out. He has trouble speaking at that point. He has a, ha ha a hand basket. Everything's going to hell in a hand basket. But that's not why we're suffering. We're suffering because we cling. 
So think about that. You have to look inside. This is why we meditate. So we comprehend the clinging by seeing that the things that we cling to are not worth it. We look for the allure of why we want to cling. But then we have to say, okay, when you cling, these are the problems. Now a lot of times we say, well, I've got to cling, otherwise what am I, what's going to happen to me? This is why the Buddha reminds you of that third noble truth, that it is possible to find a happiness that is totally unalloyed, totally un, unblemished, totally just totally total, unchanging, will never disappoint you. That's the standard which, against which we look at the rest of the world. We say that, yeah, the rest of the world doesn't measure up. So that's the first duty we have to keep in mind. And this is how you go about applying appropriate attention, where you see where you're clinging. You have to look at it to see why it's not worth it, how you can develop a sense of dispassion toward it. Because that's what it means to comprehend it. You comprehend it to the point where you realize it's not worth it. And it's for ca the causes of suffering. When the Buddha talks about appropriate attention, he talks about the hindrances. These are some of the defilements that get in the way of getting the mind to settle down. You have to look at them in an appropriate way as well. And one of the most interesting ones is where the Buddha talks about sloth and torpor. He says, there is a potential, there is a dhatu in the mind for energy. There's a potential for energy. The word dhatu can also be translated as element. That's the common translation. But when you look at how the Buddha talks about dhatu, he talks about it both in terms of the physical world, the dhatu of water, fire, wind, earth, space. And there's the dhatu of the mental world. There's consciousness itself is a dhatu. And then there are qualities in the mind. There's the dhatu of renunciation. There's the dhatu of sensuality. In each case, with the exception of the, the dhatu of earth, the fact that we have these phenomena in the world of fire, or floods, or winds, or these phenomena in the mind, sensual desire. He says, it's the provocation of the dhatu. In other words, it's a potential there, and there's something we do to provoke it. Like when you make a fire, it provokes the fire element. When you get fascinated with sensual thoughts, the sensuality element the sensuality potential gets activated. So you begin to realize these things just don't happen on their own. A lot of your experience is based on what you provoke, and you have choices. In this particular case, when you're getting slothful and torpid, you have to remind yourself there is a potential for energy in the body. Think about what would happen if suddenly there were a fire. And you had to get out, and you find that you can run out a lot faster than you thought you could. There are stories of people lifting huge objects to get them out of a burning house, which ordinarily they wouldn't be able to lift. So we have within us potentials for energy that are pretty much untapped. One of the things you have to learn as a monk, as a meditator, is to find those potentials, because otherwise you sit and meditate for a while and you start getting sleepy, and part of the mind will say, oh, the sign that I need to rest. You have to fight that tendency to see if the mind is just lying to itself, getting lazy. And so you have to look in the body. How can you energize the mind? How can you energize the body so you can continue sitting and you can continue staying focused longer than you might have expected? The you know, John's talk about this a lot. And John Mahabua says, you have to learn how to be amazed at yourself for putting out that amount of effort. 
that's when you know you're putting out enough. What's it John Lee saying? He found that it was almost like his bones were made out of iron. He learned how to sit so long. It's from pushing the envelope, trying to find what reserves of energy you have and actually using them instead of just keeping them in reserve all the time. So in this case, whenever there's a hindrance, the first thing you have to realize, okay, it is a hindrance. When there's sensual desire, the mind tends to side with it. When there's ill will, you tend to side with it. The person that you would like to see suffer really deserves to suffer. That's what you tell yourself. When you're feeling sleepy, okay, the sign you've got to give in to the sleep. Well, that's what you just tell yourself. The Buddha calls that inappropriate attention. Appropriate attention is when you say, I've got to fight this, because this is an obstacle, it's an impediment. It's what's keeping me from understanding what's going on, why I'm suffering. As for restlessness and anxiety, there is a potential for stillness in the mind. There is a part of the mind that just watches. So when distracting thoughts come in, and they seem to come on thick and fast, you realize, okay, there's a part of the mind that can just step out of the way. It doesn't have to get involved. Sometimes you find if you fight them off, things just get worse. You say, well, just get out of the way. Those thoughts want to run, let them run, but you don't have to run along with them. That's an important realization in the meditation, is realizing that your thoughts may go out, but you don't have to run out along with them. You can just stay right here. And when you don't go out running after them, they, only go, they go only so far, and then they die. But if you run along with them, it's like going out in, in the foggy night with your flashlight, and you want to see how far the beam of the flashlight goes. So you continue walking along, walking along, walking along. Of course, the more you walk along, the further it goes. There'll be no end to it. But you just stay right here. The flashlight can beam can go where it wants, but you don't have to get involved with it. As for the hindrance of doubt, the Buddha says, you look at your mind and see what is bright and what's dark, what is skillful and what is unskillful. If you're not sure, well, act on different qualities of mind and see what kind of actions they lead to. In other words, you don't overcome your doubts just by saying, I believe, I believe, and believe in the Dharma. You get down to the, the basic question that the Buddha asks, what is skillful, what is unskillful? That's how he described his search. He searched for what is skillful. We have this tendency to reduce the Dharma to sound bites. Some people say it's all about letting go. Some people say it's all about acceptance. And the Buddha reduces things to the simplest terms. It's all about what is skillful and what is unskillful. And in the beginning, he'll give you some lists as to which actions are skillful and which ones are not. But as you get into the practice, you realize that question of what's skillful and what's not gets more and more subtle. It's a very basic distinction, but it's not as simple as it seems. There's a lot to explore there. But that's basically what we have to focus on, realizing that there are skillful qualities in the mind, and when you act on them, you get good results. When you act on the unskillful qualities, you get bad results. And by seeing that, you can overcome your doubts. As for appropriate attention applied to the path, the duty there, of course, is to develop it. When the Buddha talks about appropriate attention in this area, he doesn't talk about the path so much. He talks about the seven factors for awakening. And here again, there are certain dhatu in the mind, certain potentials in the mind. There are qualities that provide a foothold, as the Buddha said, in other words, that sustain mindfulness. There are qualities that sustain concentration, that sustain equanimity. You want to look for them. In some cases, he tells you outright, in the terms of mindfulness, it's what he calls purified virtue and views made straight. Unless you straighten out your views in terms of what's skillful and what's not. 
and then you make sure that your virtue is pure. Because if there are blemishes in your virtue, in cases, in other words, where you've harmed somebody or harmed yourself, you don't want to think about them, you put up a wall. Just hide that from yourself. And the more walls there are in your mind, the harder it's going to be to remember things. You want a clear mind so that you can remember. You did this, you got those results. You did that, you got these results. And how you can apply that experience, apply that knowledge or that memory to what you're doing right now. In terms of analysis of the qualities, that's actually the same thing. Or the way of developing that, applying appropriate attention there, is to look into that issue, what's skillful and what's not, what's bright and dark in the mind. Same way that you deal with the hindrance of doubt. On this follows persistence, which again, you look for the potential for energy in the body. This factor for awakening counters sloth and torpor. And the remaining factors have to do with getting the mind into good concentration, rapture, calm, concentration, equanimity. These are things you develop. You look for the potentials there in the mind, for it to settle down. Because the mind does have these potentials. The present moment as it comes is not just a, a finished product. It's a work in progress. And there are potentials there. You learn how to provoke the potential, activate the potential for the good, good potentials and leave the unskillful attention, potentials alone. You find that you have more abilities in the path than you would have thought. So try to amaze yourself with how, how much potential you have. Because that's what the Buddhist teachings are all about, is to show us that there's a lot more that we can do than we have been doing terms of training the mind. And if we simply go through the motions, that's all we get, motions. But if we find ourselves inspired by the Buddha's example, inspired by the example of the Great Ajahns, we're going to put out more than we would ordinarily would. And John Mahabha talks about how when he was young, he had heard the party line in Bangkok, which is that Nibbana was no longer possible. And he was afraid that if he practiced, he would just be putting himself through needless needless torture and needless pain. But he stopped to realize the Buddha didn't set out the path to torture anybody, to, to be fruitless. The path has fruit. And as the Buddha said, it's a galico. It doesn't depend on the time. It depends on these basic principles the unfold path, the basic principles of the Four Noble Truths and their duties. And those are always true. So when he came, overcame his fear that he would wear himself out for nothing, that was when he was actually able to get on the path. And as he said, to find how amazing the results of the path were. So to get amazing results, you have to amaze yourself with the potentials that you have, to look into them. That's what appropriate attention is all about, looking for those potentials inside you, not just giving up. Because the potentials are there, and you can make the most of them. <laughs>